Hi, everybody. It's me, Samantha Letois. Welcome back to UCTV. Today, it's Wednesday, July 22nd, and I want to say welcome and welcome and welcome to another amazing episode and another panel discussion in UCTV. This is by Unity Coalition, and this show is provided by Gilead Care Resource and Ambiente Magazine. On today, UCTV, July 22nd, remember here on Facebook Live, 4 p.m., and then you can watch on Instagram at 5 p.m. Today, our amazing Revenue Houston Cypress present public life, history, social justice, and art. Yes, honey, we're going to be continue talking with, with the amazing Houston Revenues because we all love him and we all need to learn more about him. So let me remind you the Elevate Virtual Summer Camp is here and it's tomorrow, tomorrow, honey. Yes, because we are ready in collaboration with All Shift LGBT Festival. So you want to get more information, go to the website unitycoalition.org tomorrow, Thursday, July 23rd, 7 p.m. presenting Emma. This is an amazing opportunity just to watch this movie and have more fun at the virtual elevate in collaboration with Ocean Film Festival. We have a beautiful surprise for you. Just remember tomorrow, July 23rd, 7 p.m. here on Facebook Live. Because remember, we always have fun and it's free and fabulous. Go and check it out on the website so you can have your tickets just to watch the movie and go to check it out so you can have everything. Just buy your ticket for Emma. That's the movie that has the Ocean Field Festival have it for you. And also Unity Coalition have a beautiful surprise for all of you as well. Let me remind you, this is not over, honey, and we need to keep your mask on. Estos números no han terminado, así que continúe colocándose la máscara, lavándose las manos, es nuestra recomendación de el día de hoy. This is our recommendation for today, honey. Just take it. Put your mask on because numbers are getting higher. I don't want to see you sick, honey. Just keep it safe, protect your love, and wash your hands every time that you're going out. This is my recommendation for today. And let me remind you, October 1st to the 15th is Celebrate Your Guyo here in Miami because Unity Coalition have a different program. You want to get more information, go ahead and check it out. Instagram, unitycoalition.org or the website, unitycoalition.org. Coaliciónunida.org, October 1st to the 15, 2020. Celebrate Orgullo, Miami Hispanic and Indigenous Pride Festival since it 2011. So don't miss this opportunity. It's going to be 15 days, honey, of have fun, have information, performers, addicts, music. And you know what? It's not only in the U.S. We have artists from around the world. So we're going to perform all countries. They're going to perform in the virtual um, Celebrate Orgullo, remember, October 1st to the 15th. And helping the community. Microgiving fund, coronavirus is still helping the community. We are getting every day more and more people that lost their job just for everything that happened with the COVID-19. So let's keep it helping. Most of you bartenders, drag queen, and also waitress, they're out of work. Go to the website, also the unitycoalition.org and donate because we have an amazing opportunity for the service community. You're passing by the situation that is like no income. Don't worry, just fill that out application at unitycoalition.org and then wait for the answer, share on your social media and donate because we don't hold any money. So everything that we get is just for you because the people is needed right now, especially the LGBT community here in South Florida. So that's my recommendation for all of you. Houston, are you ready? Are you here? Are you ready? Are you here? Salutation, sister. Hey, boo. How are you? And thank you so much. Welcome to UCTV one more time. Yes, it's always a pleasure to hang out with you. You always bring a good vibe. You're always so happy, and I appreciate that. We need more of that love and that joy in the world. Absolutely, absolutely. We need more, more love that you have for all of us. So we need more of you. We need more of you. So tell me, what do you have for all of us today?
So let's figure it out. In the meantime, like Houston is trying to fix uh, everything that happened. You know, this is life, honey. So things happen. Let me remind you today, Wednesday, 22nd, Houston is revenue today. And also we're going to talk about public life, history and social justice and art. This is people that is on the way, honey. So you need to know what's going on. We, um, let me remind you here, because it's a little bit difficult for me, but let me say you, this Cunia Rockway, Joseph, and also Puner Wiener. So those of them, it will be with us. I know. So Houston is here. Are you here? Finally. I think I'm back. I had to do a disappearing act. I'm so sorry. I'm a magical That's person. okay. That's okay. So <laughs> cool. tell me. What do we have for today? Cool. So history is at the forefront of the public life today. So I invited some of my friends from the arts community and some artists today to talk to us a little bit more about why is history the subject of so much conversation and so much argumentation, but also celebration. So we're going to talk about history, public life, and how we can use arts to build communities and celebrate our lives today. So I'm really looking forward to introducing you to my friends and colleagues. And so who we have today, I'm going to be talking with um, artist Pioneer Winter, um, as well as Cunha Rowley and Joseph Cloud. Um, before we say hello to them, I just want to tell you a little bit more about them, OK? Um, Pioneer Winter is a Miami-based choreographer and a dancer, and he directs Pioneer Winter Collective. Now, the collective is this really amazing group of people that does contemporary dance and physical theater, and I really like what they do because they're a company of allied bodies, and they're really trying to democratize performance in public spaces like museums, the galleries, stages, and films. So that's a little bit about Pioneer. Our friend Cunha, is a native of Miami, Florida, is an alum of the New World School of the Arts College's opera program. But their work kind of traverses all sorts of genres. So he's a, um, he also won the Night Arts Challenge recipients for this project that we're gonna learn more about. It's called Huge Songs and it celebrates black history. And my friend Joseph, Joseph is a citizen of Cherokee Nation He's a Miami Fellow of Class 11 and is the Artistic Programs Manager at the National Young Arts Foundation and Board President for this amazing collective called Mangrove Creative Collective. So I'm really looking forward to learn more about what they're up to and what their projects are. But we really have some interesting ideas to discuss. So welcome, Pioneer, and also you and Joseph. So welcome to UCTV, guys. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so I think one of the things that I wanted to check in with y'all, just because we have like starting the discussion, because we're talking so much about history and public life, but what about our personal history? So I want to give a little bit of time for each of you to ask the, to answer this question. But um, thinking about our history, our identity, our culture, like how did we learn about that? Like how did we experience that as children? And like how does that impact our lives today as adults or impacting our artistic process? So I want to check in with Pioneer Winter first, and then we'll go with uh, Cunha and Joseph. But yeah, share with us a little bit more about your background, Pioneer. Sure. Um, so I'm a Miami native, uh, born and raised here in Miami, Florida. I uh, grew up Jehovah's Witness. Uh, so that certainly affected uh, the way I um, uh, understood history and faith and uh, the systems that are in place that are created as a way of like keeping us in line, so to speak. Um, but my, uh, my family uh, is Jewish, so it was always this, this weird uh, disconnect between uh, the growing up with my mom and dad that were Jehovah's Witnesses and then understanding where like the, the majority of my family was as far as their belief systems. And then as I grew older and I was able to uh, make decisions for myself, um, I was able to see that like a lot of the history that I was taught, uh, even the quote unquote uh, reformed or um, restorative history was still um, you know, not 
not true. Um, and what I found as an adult now, uh, approaching faith and approaching uh, the, the the history that I align myself with, um, it's uh, it, it's one that is um, that that sees performance as uh, and and art making as an act of faith in itself, and it's something that I think um, uh, steers me uh, in both my my mission as well as my my own morale um, and and what I use to guide myself. Um, so it was it was an interesting childhood, but dance has always been there. The art has always been there, and I think that's been the thing that I've held on to um, uh, through everything. That's beautiful, and I definitely want to dive a little bit deeper in terms of that um, as we go along the conversation. But let's go ahead and check in with Joseph and Cunha. Joseph and Cunha, do you guys want to share a little bit about your background and how that impacts your life today? First, you first. Cool. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this, and so I was raised by my my grandmother. My grandmother is from um, Trinidad, and she was raised by European nuns. And so our upbringing for my brother and I was really interesting. Um, you know, in the Caribbean, my, my grandmother often talks about there not really being a race issue, but there really being um, a, a class divide. And so for her, growing up, the most important thing, you know, we rarely talked about race. We rarely talked about the fact that she was raising two black sons. Um, you know, for her, it was about having us in good schools so that we can have good futures and have good jobs. And, you know, I think what that translated to was um, us often being in, in areas where we were um, one of very few black children, being in schools where we were one of few black children. And I think growing up, there was a little exposure for me to black history and black culture. And unfortunately, all I really like was exposed to was what was on TV and in media. And I, you know, growing up, I actually really believed that being a black person meant that I was in, was inferior. Um, and I think it really goes to- Think about our history. There you go, continue. Yeah, I think it just goes to show you that, you know, how important it is to really have positive, um, positive media, positive influences in just in culture and TV. And so I think um, that's really driven a lot of the work that I've done with Cute Songs is I really want to show and try to provide a platform where people see themselves, people can hear themselves, people see their story um, and see the the culture and the, um, the history of black people that's, that's really beautiful. Um. For me, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma. Uh, I was born into a Cherokee Nation at a Cherokee hospital. And for most of my life as a kid, that's really all I knew about being Cherokee. Um, so for me, I was, you know, raised in a small town. We were raised as white kids, um, which was a part of the system that, you know, my grandparents were a part of with relocating to California because the government told them, you know, go here, have a great job, get away from your nation and your identity culturally. So for me, I was raised as a white kid in Cherokee Nation. Um, then I, you know, later in life in my early 20s, mid 20s started, you know, wanting to connect more and having this yearning to learning a bit more about who I am. And so um, for me, it's been a long process of unlearning and relearning, which continues today, you know, um, in, in, in what we're going through in our world today, in my personal journey. Um, it's just trying to uncover um, the true realities and the true histories and learn more about what those are and how we then tell our stories, which I think is really vitally important to um, just our, our cultural identity. The artists that tell the stories um, are, are, are super important to getting the message out and to sort of correcting what people don't understand, um, which is a lot of the work that we try to do with Mangrove Creative Collective. We want to we wanna support artists trying to tell their stories. We want to tell South Florida stories. Uh, we want to help people shape those stories um, and be a connector to different organizations or different people or different um, ways of learning. Uh, so we just try to be that for people and connect people as best we can as we continue to learn. This is where we vamp. Come on, Pioneer. Let's stand. Yes. 
<laughs> that was a really great dance. It was a little bit of a workout, you know, in the background. But guys, let me tell you, that's an amazing opportunity for artists and for people that they, as you said, that you want to share their story, you want to share their opportunity. But also personally, I want to like, like, I want to just want to put out there that it's a great opportunity for people that they do not identify with their background culture. You know, most of the time, like me, I'm from Colombia, but I don't know what was going on with my ancestors. What was, I didn't know what was happening in that situation. And even if you know, or you don't believe about it, things that happened in the past with your ancestor, it will be reflecting in your actual life in the present. So I just want to put out there, you know, because I got this on my mind, you know, I'm blessed and I'm black. So. Houston. Yeah. I'm really happy that you brought up the work of the, the Mango Creative Collective because you guys went out to visit the Mikasuki tribe and you were able to collaborate on creating some new artwork with the students out there. And like growing up in the Mikasuki, like we have a different way of remembering our histories. A lot of our histories are, are spoken word, it's the oral tradition, and we rely so much on landmarks, the trees, the grass, like what happened in the places. But it's also frustrating for us because we need a healthy Everglades for our culture to thrive. And now that we're facing a situation where the Everglades is in danger, that also puts our own histories and the stories that we tell in danger. And so I think that's a, that's a good way of like talking about like the public monuments that, that, um, that we're dealing with as a society these days, because people are wanting to remove um, monuments and also like put in monuments that are kind of controversial. And some say that as we do that, we're like erasing history. So I wanted to like ask you all, like, what are your thoughts on that? Are like removing or replacing statues and monuments in the public sphere? Are we erasing history? I I don't think we're erasing a history that was never something that was collectively agreed on in the first place. Um, I think that we are. Um, we, we are coming to terms with the fact that, that history is, has always been very one-sided and uh, we are getting to a point now where that just isn't the reality that we are accepting any longer. Um, and and I, I totally believe in, in, in destroying and rebuilding, um, especially if it means including voices that were never included in the first place. And you know, Joseph, um, I know that you have a, a lot of interesting comments to share on this topic because you caught my attention the other day when you were um, commenting on social media about the Columbus statues in particular. So I want to hear your thoughts on the matter. Yeah, you know, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, Pioneer. I mean, you really, history can be erased, right? It's already written, so it's there. We're really talking about these markers and these monuments that, that stand as a reminder or potentially as a learning tool. Um, and I think that, you know, when it comes to Columbus, I was very happy. I'm wearing a Columbus sort of devil shirt uh, in honor of this. But um, when it comes to Columbus, I think, you know, we, we learned this history as kids about this person discovering, you know, Columbus 19, 1492 sailed the ocean blue. And it's this, this hero that came and discovered this place, um, which is completely made up. It's just as fabricated as like Disney's Pocahontas history. It's not real. Um, and so, um, you know, I just think that like, if people knew the real history, I don't know that they would want these statues up representing, you know, our past and our collective story. Um, and I think, I think it's really interesting because we learn about this as kids, right? Um, you know, you learn about it because Columbus Day happens every year. And so your parents and your elementary schools teach you who this person is in an elementary way. And I think that that history, like it binds with us and it's what we remember until we unlearn it. And so many people in this place in the world, we don't take the time to unlearn things or even realize that we have things we need to unlearn. And so it just becomes complicated. People are defending a history they don't know is real. Um, and I pulled up these two short clips to sort of take two minutes and 20 seconds from the like elementary version of history and then two minutes and 20 seconds from a real version just to sort of illuminate that. So if we can like show that a little bit here. Okay, cool.
Columbus. Hello, friends. Hello, friends. I'm Christopher, I'm Christopher Columbus. Columbus, the world, the world famous world. sailor and adventurer. I am most famous because I discovered America. But the truth is, it was all possible thanks to Isabel and Fernando, the Spanish Catholic kings who invested money enabling me to carry out the trip, as well as all the other brave crew members who accompanied me, set sail in three different ships named La Nina, La Pinta, and Santa Maria from the port Puerto de Palos in Huelva, Spain. After 72 days of sailing, on the 12th of October, 1492, a sailor named Rodrigo de Triana yelled, Land ahoy! And we disembarked and set foot on American soil as quickly as we could. But I must confess something to you. In truth, I believed that we had reached India, which was where we were heading to. It was a complete accident that we arrived at this new continent. But hard work and sacrifice always gives you rewards. After the first trip, I returned to America another three times. And I brought back to Spain unknown products in Europe, such as tomatoes, corn, potatoes, and cacao. Mmm, yummy. I also took from Spain to America food and animals which they hadn't even heard of, such as horses, sheep, pigs, onions, and wheat. Well, this is my story, friends. Now you know why I, Admiral Christopher Columbus, am so famous. But before I go, I would like to give you some advice. If you want to be happy, work and study hard. With effort and determination, one can accomplish many things. Goodbye, friends. Adios. So that's the first first one, right? And it shows this sort of happy-go-lucky, like, yay, this guy came and he did these great things. Um, I don't know if we'll... Right, we're going to be able to watch the second one, but it, it, in the same sort of short span of time, you can learn all the really, you know, terrible things he did. Like immediately, like, here we go. Let's learn that Chris, <coughs> he called the name the rest of the trip took five this was an excellent sailor. October 12th, and he found his way back spot. to his manual was not out, and a dawn Columbus went ashore. Shore. Because, because he, he believed in the small earth, earth theory, theory, Columbus, Columbus thought, thought he was near Japan. Japan. He called, he called the natives, the natives of this island Indians, Indians because, because India, India was what, was what many Europeans, Europeans called Asia, Asia at the time. But the, but the natives were really called the Taino. Taino. Trade, Trade began, began between, between the two, the two parties, parties, but it was but clear, it was clear that, that the Taino, Taino did not possess the fabled riches of East Asia. Asia. However, However, some of them, some wore, of them gold wore gold as jewelry. jewelry. Columbus, Columbus was hungry for gold to bring back to Spain. He wandered around searching for a large amount of gold until the Santa Maria crashed into a reef on Hispaniola. Columbus left 39 men at the site to build a colony. He promised he would return for them and sailed back to Spain. When he arrived in Europe, Columbus was famous. He had sailed into the unknown and returned to tell the tale. He brought back many things to show the Spanish king and queen, including Tainos he had kidnapped. But he did not bring enough gold, so Ferdinand and Isabella equipped Columbus with 17 ships for a second voyage and named him governor of all the lands he discovered. Columbus was an excellent sailor. He found his way back to Hispaniola using his own keen navigation skills and kept the coordinates of his route a secret. When the fleet arrived at Hispaniola, they found out that the 39 men who were left there to build a colony had been killed by a local chief. They also found out the same chief had lots of gold on his land. Columbus led a crew into his territory and found a gold quarry. The chief was angered by the arrogance of these invaders, and soon fighting broke out. To intimidate the chief, Columbus captured three of his captains and beheaded them in public. This enraged the Tainos and disturbed many of the Spanish. To make things worse, there was soon no gold left to mine. Columbus sent letters back to Spain on a ship and exaggerated the amount of gold that was found. To produce more profit for the king and queen, Columbus suggested starting a slave trade. Without waiting for a response, he seized over 500 natives and sent them to Spain. 
Most of the remaining natives fought against this injustice, so Columbus unleashed terror on them. Once defeated, they were forced to pay tributes of gold to the Spanish. It was worse than slavery. People who didn't find enough were punished brutally. Forced to constantly look for gold, the Taino could not farm their lands anymore. Many escaped into the hills, only to be hunted down. Even in that clip right there, the part that always gets me the most, right, is and of all the terrible things he did, he also never stepped foot on the soil that we now call the United States. And so why do these statues even exist when they don't honor anything about our history here in the U.S.? Um, and they really only glorify a part like the dominator in the story. Um, and there was this article, I know, Houston, you, you had read it as well, I think, about about this, it was an opinion piece in the Herald. Um, and one of the things that the person said, or uh, one of the like defenses is that they just say that like, oh, we shouldn't erase Spanish history, you know, and it's like a canned hatred for Columbus that people are going through. And it's a stretch to tie that into the protests that are happening now um, by saying that, oh, Columbus didn't participate in, um, in the African enslaved people coming to this country but he still participated in slavery. You know, he enslaved indigenous people. He took them back to Europe. Um, and, you know, I think that, that it's, these things need to be changed. They need to come down and, or at least tell the truth, you know, and nobody wants that because you'll have this violent sort of depiction happening for young people. And if it's too early to tell people this story at a young age, then, you know, wait, teach it alongside other atrocities in our history, like the Holocaust, you know, wait to teach it to kids. Don't tell them this sort of happy, happy version that they latch onto for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Any thoughts you want to share, Pioneer? Well, it's, uh, I agree that it, it's, never, it's never too early. Um, and I think that it really points out a, a big issue with our history if it's something that we think shouldn't be heard by young ears. You know, uh, you said it before, uh, Joseph, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the, the fallacy of defending a history that we aren't even sure is correct, right? For the sake of, for the sake of ego or for the sake of tradition um, and, and, and the way that uh, we're, we're forced to assert value then on it. Um, it's, I, I, you know, if, if you're young enough to know the difference between right and wrong, you can also uh, learn from a past so that you don't repeat it. Um, I think this is also a good time, Pioneer, to kind of dive in a little bit more about your work and your artistic process because one of the one of the many projects that I found inspiration from is the um, the Grass Stains project and how that kind of um, utilizes these public sites and public locations. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and how um, how you and your collaborators go about exploring the the meanings of these places or imbuing these places with new meaning? Absolutely. Uh, so Grass Stains was uh, supported by the Knight Foundation. So shout out to them. Uh, they um, were the, the reason for me being able to start. And um, the idea came in like around 2015 or 16. I was just seeing a lot of artists were uh, forced to create work in public spaces because of the prohibitive cost of theaters. But what was happening was sort of a copy and paste element where uh, choreographers were working in the studio for several months and then copying and pasting just like you would with like text mess, uh, you know, a text message to uh, a site and then that being the site of the performance and it not having anything to do with the, uh, the steps uh, or the, um, the conditions that were that existed around the making of the work, um, so it it turned into decoration on a site and often ignored the the historical and social uh, implications of of that space. Uh, so in 2016, we had our first set of choreographers that were commissioned uh, to create that uh, to create work in different places, and it was from Surfside to uh, the Seba tree off of Calle Ocho to the FIU Nature Preserve, um, the Kampong and Coconut Grove uh, that was owned by uh, Marion and David Fairchild. Um, that dealt a lot with, uh, with, with 
taking something where it doesn't belong and transplanting it somewhere new um, and expecting it to thrive. Uh, and then in 2018, um, Leone Garcia uh, set a work through grass stains uh, in a produce warehouse at Chicago Produce in Alapata. And Sandra Portal Andro uh, choreographed a, uh, a site specific work that was at uh, the, um, has a, it, it was the Hialeah Racetrack, but now it's called Hialeah Park Studios. Uh, and then most recently, Grass Stains has turned into something that really questions what the deliverables are for this project, um, where I was able to support 23 artists to participate in a week of excavating and questioning and uh, uh, creating site-specific work um, and downtown at the MDC Live Arts building, uh, or building one of the Wolfson campus where MDC Live Arts is, and they hosted us. Um, and I was able to uh, really uh, look at uh, the process and the importance of process in uh, an artist creating work that is socially uh, relevant and is accurate and tries its best to understand uh, its community rather than uh, just taking dance and adorning a community with it, um, but actually trying to see uh, what uh, what are the movements that are actually born in a space. And in doing so, how can it then recontextualize the space so that it can be seen with, with new eyes? Sounds to me, um, it sounds to me that we're talking about reclaiming places, the reclamation of places, and we're inserting culture in spaces that are not necessarily home to these kind of communities. So how do we cultivate a community in which the right people are telling our history and our stories? Um, do Joseph or Cunha have any comments on that matter? Yeah, you know, I think I, I want to comment and say just two things. I, Joseph and I were having this conversation yesterday, and I think um, it's by a it's building capacity. It's really like empowering artists. Re, I mean, regardless of their background, um, to like have the, to for the organization organizational support, the monetary resources to be able to tell their stories in creative ways. But I think that even in talking about how do we um, reclaiming spaces. You know, I think it's interesting because one of the things that I, I try to do in my work with Jude Songs is the idea is to, to go into spaces that are um, where the people are and to, to make art accessible. And I think that it's important to reclaim black spaces. And I think it's important to reclaim, like, reclaim space, like spaces that are queer, indigenous. Um, but I also think that like, it's really important to assert our stories into spaces um, that aren't necessarily black, queer, indigenous, or you know, um, uh, you know, of color. And I think that's. I think it's really important that like we're seen and we're heard um, in in all types of spaces. And so I think um, it really has. It's it's kind of like this like this balancing act um, of of building community through for, through like bridging that gap. Yeah, like well, like you're saying, it's important that. Not only do does the art come to people and meet them where they are, but that people understand that you can go anywhere and you're welcome there and you can see the art where it's happening, no matter who you are. That we're all invited to the table. Yeah. I think is vitally important. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that I really appreciate about this particular organization, Unity Coalition, because Unity Coalition is about um, celebrating and advocating for the LGBTQ plus communities. And I love the way that this organization does it like multilingually. At the very least, they do things in English and Spanish, but I really love the way that they try to embrace so much of the multicultural aspect that we bring as people, as divas, as artists. And so like, like thinking a little bit more about like the community that tells our stories. Like I was super frustrated with this film that came out a couple of years ago, the Stonewall film. Uh. And how it was kind of like whitewashing um, the, 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 the trans and uh, the people of color, the people that threw that first rock at that riot, which has set the stage for so much of the liberation and the rights that we're still struggling for these days. 
And so I wanted to check in with you, Pioneer, because you did an amazing project, the Reprise project, that was involved with like, um, had a really unique historical research process. Can you tell us more about that project and what you learned, what were the challenges and what were the joys that came out of doing that work? Sure, sure. Um, and it, it kind of goes back to the, the question that you're asking before about the right people telling our stories. And I guess the, the answer to that um, I found through Reprise and through Gimpgate and Fourth Century and other love stories and uh, pretty much uh, uh, the majority of the work that that Pioneer One Two Collective has done has been um, uh, a resoundful no to voices outside of our own telling our stories. And I think the success of Reprise wasn't that there were no actors on stage, there wasn't anyone portraying anything other than what they are and who they are. Um, and uh, Reprise was a great deal about like organizing um, a group of uh, collaborators who are in themselves marginalized and othered, but also uh, there's this, this mutual allyship and that everybody is taking turns being an ally to each other by understanding when to, uh, when to step forward, when to step back, uh, when to speak up, when to listen. Um, so Reprise had a lot to do with that, and it, it focused on some very distinct stories. It focused on Hector Machado, who's a performer uh, with the collective. Uh, he uses a wheelchair uh, and um, uh, uses uh, they, them, and uh, he, his pronouns, um, and is also uh, um, uh, just seen from the outside as a threat just because of the color of his skin. Um, but we wouldn't have gotten to that place if it wasn't the expectation that we all were entering the space um, expecting to, um, to become anything that we aren't already. Uh, that this is really about uh, voices that um, were not only unheard, but voices that were told to be quiet too often. Uh, and so uh, right now it's about a reclaiming of that, of that, that platform, that megaphone, which we use uh, the, the megaphone as, as, a, as a metaphor throughout the work, as uh, uh, who gets to hold the power or who has agency over their own voice. I think that was uh, such powerful work because it is um, it holds up a mirror. It was such powerful work because it holds up a mirror to society, the society that we're that we're witnessing undergoing a rebirth. Whether you want to call it a rebirth of society, a revolution, a movement, like so much of this vital community energy is filling the streets these days. Um, whether it's with the Black Lives Movement or echoing the kind of riots that we were just talking about from like echoing the work of Stonewall. But today we're talking about um, social justice and um, maybe we can reflect a little bit more on like what the Black Lives Movement Matter movement means to us um, as we think about public life and how we celebrate our histories and, and unearth the histories that have been hidden. So I guess I just wanted to get some reflection from you all like, what do you all think about what's going on in terms of all the energy that's coming into the public gatherings and the public spaces these days? Uh, you know, I'll jump in. You know, I think that so much of this was was long overdue um, with just historically with what has been happening. Um, I mean, for, for, sorry, I have like, for, for Black people, um, you know, I think that, Oh, there you go. Um, but, and I think that it, it just so happens that, especially in this, coupled with kind of this, like this pandemic and this, like the, um, and COVID, especially, especially at a time where we know that people of color are disproportionately like affected and impacted by, um, by, by this pandemic. We know um, that this is a history that like is rooted in so many systemic barriers. Um, I think that this was just, I mean, it's it's been long coming, um, but I think that what I, what is important and what is uh, gives me some hope um, is that 
we're seeing it, it's, it's consistent. Because um, I think that's part of the challenge is, is making sure that, that story and those voices are amplified and our voices are amplified continually, um, that that momentum doesn't fizzle and doesn't die. <clears throat> and I think that it, it really is, it requires us to be unapologetic about A, the, um, what we want, unapologetic about who we are, unapologetic about the stories we want to tell, um, and unapologetic about how we want to tell them and how we want to be seen. Pioneer, any thoughts on the matter? I, it's it's all choreography. It's all it's all bodies moving in space. It's constellations of bodies that are responding to each other. Um, I, I think um, a lot of what artists talk about in the studio can be seen very evident uh, outside today. Uh, and just even experiencing protesting and this, this, this gathering of bodies together, this, this mass of bodies that are all walking the same direction, are chanting the same thing, are believing in the same thing and have the same expectations. Um, I mean, like you see such powerful change from that. Uh, and as, as someone who tries to see dance in all bodies and all experiences, it was incredibly apparent to me the, uh, the the intimate act of choreography, uh, even in public spaces as gathering in Wynwood in downtown Miami over the, the past couple of weeks. Uh, and then also seeing how dangerous or, or how, how we are perceived as dangerous when we are in mass by authority like uh, police officers and how, how scared they are of people that come together. And I mean, that's, that that's it right there. That that you're you're moving the in the right direction when you're moving together. <clears throat> and you know, like um, a, growing up in my my own Mekisuki community, um, I've kind of grown up with the idea that what we call arts has been integrated into a traditional way of life. And so, like the way that I might talk about choreography or the kind of chanting that we do or they're kind of like um, standing heavy on the ground, like we might refer to that as magic. We might refer to that as medicine. Mm -hmm. And so like I was really proud when um, in this other conversation that I was having with some organizers that we are doing our best to try to integrate like spiritual practices in the work because as, um, as vital and as energetic and as kind of like um, forceful as we're trying to do this work in the public sphere, like I think overall, like it's leaning toward the direction of healing. And so like overall, like we're trying to like um, create a better situation for everybody. And so it reminds me of the fact that we're, we're finding ourselves in the context of reconciliation these days, whether or not our, our elected officials or our leaders want to acknowledge that. Like back in around, I think it was around 2009 or so, the United States actually apologized to the native peoples of the United States but not very many people know about it. And it actually took a poet to bring it to our attention, Miss Laylee Long Soldier. So um, I think about the fact that like so much of what we're trying to do can seem um, challenging, but I think like we're all like ultimately going in the right direction of like trying to build a better world for ourselves, trying to build to bring our communities, our communities together in ways that help each other out. And so um, I think that there's a lot of magic that is present in the work that we're doing. So can you tell me a little bit more about the kind of magic that you all are working on? Like what's coming up for you these days? What are the, what are the creations that you're conjuring through your practices? And uh, I'd like to check in with Kunya and Joseph and let us know what's coming up for them. Hold on, we gotta adjust the audio. Okay, your audio is back. Well, for me, uh, you know, with Mangrove, it's all about supporting people right now. And so I uh, feel very passionate about like taking a step back and listening to my artist friends and how they are and what they're doing and what they need and how can I how can I guide that in any way, not because I know more, but just because I wanna support them. Um, and so it's been connecting with people I know, you know, uh, trying to then connect them to opportunities or, um, 
or you know funding sources or even mentors right now um, and then like supporting my friends and or husband on con uh, on a concert that's coming up on um upcoming projects that he's working on now so i'll let you take that away <laughs> um i first want to say that actually for the first couple of months of the pandemic i felt really just artistically paralyzed and i think and i actually am okay with that like i needed to take a break um and so i think what i found though and especially with what's happening right now in our community um i felt a little bit just paralyzed but i just i didn't know really how to how to engage and so i think for me especially now with my work for huge songs um it's really provided this kind of platform to be able to like talk about how i feel see myself um and talk through things and so one of the things that it's coming up very soon actually um so huge songs and i i've uh, received a grant from uh, gable stage for their engage at gable stage um to create a short digital work um and so huge songs is presenting a work called my a digital work called my black body is and really the idea was what does it feel to be in a body and to inhabit a body that is celebrated that is revered that is fetishized that is uh, traumatized that's over sexualized that's killed and so it's going to be a um a multimedia work it's going to feature uh classical singing so it's myself and another actress and opera singer we've got spoken word um we are using um some really stunning imagery from uh, a visual artist uh, named Roddy Jones II um, from his Melanated series. Um, and so that is going to be premiering um, online on August 7th. Um, so very soon at 7 p.m. It was a Friday. Yeah. And just to like, just to like shout out their names, Rebecca Hargrove is the uh, other singer that will be a part of this. Yes. And then the other uh, spoken actor and also designer who's putting it all together for us is Ace Anderson. And that's a part of like what I love to do. Those are people I know through Young Arts that I've met on my journey that were like, hey, here, work together. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. You and the collective pioneer. I, could you repeat that, Houston? I, I agree. Just wanted to check in with you. Like, what are you working on? What's um, what's coming? Um, what's on your plate these days creatively? What are you working on? Yeah. So the um, the the quarantine, the pandemic hit at a time right where we were about to uh, hit our 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 stride with this new project called Birds of Paradise, and. Um, we were supported by National Dance Project and MAP Fund, and it's the first time that the collective has been funded by uh, a national arts organization like that. And then the Arts Center came in uh, to commission us for that work, and we are the first uh, artists in residence in over a decade working with the Arts. Um, and now, because of the quarantine, our residency is not a year, it's two years, so that gives us some extra time to work on it. But Birds of Paradise is really looking at how can uh, the uh, South Florida queer community uh, come uh, come to a, an understanding of uh, the uh, of our our the impetus behind great acts and deeds, especially uh, in moments of doubt? Um, I think I, I deeply resonate with what Cunha was talking about, with feeling like this this uh, paralyzed feeling at the beginning of the quarantine, uh, not knowing what to do, not knowing. Uh, whether or not we should uh, power through, whether or not we should work more, work less. Uh, so we've been. Um, uh, this has been, you know, a, a, a test of uh, of our um, uh, of our ability as artists. Um, but I do want to give a shout out to the artists that are involved with Birds of Paradise because um, it's a lot of first for us. Uh, it'll be uh, eight performers working with us. Um, some of them are core members of the collective and some of them came on, especially for Birds of Paradise, and I'm hoping they'll continue with us after. Um, and they are Frank Camposano, Liza Lota Pitlo, uh, Katrina Petrarca, Nurka Marquez, Hector Machado, Barbara Mulliner, um, Justice Rodriguez, uh, Torian DeVoe, um, and I think I'm missing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, that's everyone. And then uh, uh, additionally, uh, for the first time, I'm working with a uh, composer. This will be the first time we've had original sound, uh, Yurai Koj. 
And for the first time ever, we won't have to order our costumes from Amazon.com because now we have an incredible designer working with us, Chaplain Tyler, um, who I actually um, was able to really come to understand Chaplin's work because she collaborated with uh, Unity Coalition uh, back in December for that uh, Art After Stonewall exhibit at the Frost Museum. So shout out to Unity Coalition for bringing artists together. Um, but uh, we're still working on that project and uh, we're actually inviting um, as many community voices that want to, to be a part of uh, the uh, discussions and the, um, the ideation of the work. But uh, it, in a, it's really about that moment where you're holding on and you're about to let go and you aren't sure whether or not that's just to like get your grip again or whether this time you'll actually fall and giving into the fall and fall giving way to rebirth and uh, transcendence and you know those 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 magic moments that you're talking about Houston so we're looking forward to premiering that now um, September of 2021 at the Arch Center and it's an incredible platform for uh, there to be so many uh, queer voices involved. All right, so as we, um, just a quick final question. I wanted to see if you all have any advice for our viewers, um, because we had a, a quick moment to just kind of thank the people that are working with us. Um, do you have any advice or um, things to watch out for or things that we can do by using the arts as coalition building process? So do you have any advice on that matter? And, and that's like the final question before we start wrapping up. Arts is coalition building. Any advice on that matter? And uh, we'll check in with Kunya and Joseph. I think there's a lot of space for, you know, find the artists you like right now and, and follow their work um, and, and dig in deeper to it, you know. Um, reach out to them and talk to them. People have time right now to communicate more than they ever did before. Um, to new people and to expand their networks. And, and so I, I would encourage folks to um, really engage with the artists that they appreciate um, and get to know them more, look at their work, research their work. Um, and then the institutions that are supporting artists, seek those out as well. Um, find ones with missions that align with what you're passionate about so that you can support them um, and give them a call and ask them what artists they're supporting. Um, I think that those are ways that we can Get, get together and support the people that are telling the stories of, of, of uh, telling our stories um, and to put our resources where, where we can, whether that is your money or your time or your um, influence, which I think is really important. Yeah, and I, I, I totally absolutely agree with that. And I think also in that support, there's so many fantastic, I think we're seeing so many artists and new artists really leveraging technology to define a voice and define a platform. So I we just so continue supporting. And I think it's important we we talk about support, we talk about resources. It's totally, it's not just money, it's also in time. It's in like what we know that access, um, inequitable access is also about access to information, if, um, access to like organizational support, access to um to to, to resources in, in, in terms of um, people time. And so I think absolutely find those organizations, and if you can support in one of those multitude of ways, like, please do so. An arts is coalition building. Yeah, I, I I think that we've really proven through this pandemic that artists supporting artists is where it's at, and 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 uh, starting to debunk this this edifice and these gatekeepers of. Of, uh, of venues and uh, presenters and funders, because uh, uh, when when all of those have 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 uh, really uh, started to to cave in because of the the current uh, climate we're in right now and just how how unforeseeable the future is, it's the artists that have been the resilient ones. It's artists that have demonstrated their grit and it's artists that everybody has been looking for and looking toward. Um, I, I'm, I try to take on as many responsibilities as possible for my collective um, writing the grants. So I have a lot of experience with that. So I, I, I guess my message would be if there are any artists that are watching that have never applied for a grant before and need some help, need some pointers. Uh, I wanna offer my uh, experience and any 
uh, advice that would be um, valuable to, to anybody watching that is interested in self-funding their work and finding the appropriate resources to do so. Um, so I just want to put that out there. Cool. And, um, and I just have a, a final bit of advice. For, I just have a final bit of advice for Arts is Coalition Building 3. As an environmentalist, I want to encourage our viewers to remember that we have the natural world that we can count on as collaborators as well. So remember to show the love that we have for the Everglades and the natural world around us. So thank you very much to Kunya Rowley, Joseph Cloud, and Pioneer Winter. I've had a great time chatting with you and I look forward to catching you again. So have a beautiful day, friends. Thank you. And so um, I wanna remind our, our viewers and our guests that tomorrow we do have the Elevate Virtual Summer Camp. It's gonna be at 7 p.m. here on Unity Coalition UCTV. So make sure to tune in and check it out. We also have some really amazing upcoming events as an organization. So one of the things that we're working on is a collaboration with the Outshine Film Festival. We're gonna be premiering a, a project called Emma. And so make sure that you make some time to enjoy these offerings by Unity Coalition. And one of the, one of the great events that we're building up to is gonna be 15 days of Celebrate Orgullo, October 1 through October 15. This is Miami's Hispanic and Indigenous Pride Festival since 2011. So make some, make some time to join us on any of these activities that Unity Coalition is offering. The Elevate Virtual Summer Camp, the Outshine Film Festival premiere, and Celebrate Orgullo. So again, this is a UCTV, a production of Unity Coalition, Coalición Unida. My name is Houston Cypress from the Otter Clan of the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. And I wanna say thank you so much for joining us today. It's an honor to be with you. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night at the Elevate Virtual Summer Camp. Have a beautiful evening, everybody. Much love and much respect.